Hello, welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast Series, the world's largest weekly leadership podcast globally. My name is Scott Miller. I am honored to serve as your host and interviewer each week. I also released a book about the podcast from HarperCollins Leadership titled Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds. I looked at the first 100 or so interviews, picked out the ones that I thought were the most transformational, wrote a fast, easy, breezy chapter about each of them with their permission. People like Kim Scott, General McChrystal, Dr. Daniel Amen, Ann Chow, Nick Vujicic, Stephanie McMahon, Whitney Johnson, Nancy Duarte, Stephen M. R. Covey, and others. And I've just finished the manuscript for the second volume in that series titled Master Mentors with 30 new transformative insights from 30 new guests on our way to 10 volumes in the Master Mentors series. Hope you pick up a copy of Volume 1 and pre-order Volume 2 coming out in October, again from Harper Collins Leadership. Kind of the new chicken soup for the leadership soul, if you will. Today's guest is Dutch. He's joining us live from Amsterdam. His name is Rick Pasteur. He is by trade a uh, software engineer. He is an entrepreneur. He is an expert on productivity and time management. His new release is called GRIP. The Art of Working Smart and Getting to What Matters Most. Rick, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you so much, Scott. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have international guests. You are a literary icon in Europe. Your book has sold, of course, extraordinarily well in the Netherlands, and we're delighted to have you to the mix of uh, typically American guests, but we're, we're always interested in bringing a broader voice to this podcast, to our listeners and viewers Worldwide, Rick, as we get into the insights you've learned on really working smart, why don't you take a few minutes and talk about your journey, your education, some of your entrepreneurial experience, and kind of what led you to writing this book? Yeah, so, so um, one of the things that I noticed in the last startup that I was in was that I worked with a lot of young people, and I was a manager there. And what I've, one of the things that I noticed that is that well, we never really get taught how to work, uh, how to do our work. Really, the uh, the day to day. So Monday morning, nine a.m. What do you do? Um, and they saw that I read a bunch of these books, and I love those books. Uh, so I started recommending them, and said, "You need to read Seven Habits. You need to read Get It Things Done. You need to read Start with Why. You need to read all the, the great and fantastic books on the on these uh, on these topics that are out there." And they would, well, roll their eyes at me and say, okay, Rick, uh, please, I'm up until here to, to the neck and above in, in the work. Uh, and I don't, know, I don't know where to get the energy and the time to, uh, to get to all this. So please give me the shortest possible summary uh, to get out of my mess. And that's basically what I've, what I've uh, written down. And I think if I look back on my own trajectory, um, one of the biggest lessons that I learned uh, before when I'm running my when when running my own agency and developing software for for clients is that um, if the work is not done well or and or on time you're not getting paid uh, and that's a fundamental lesson that I've since brought to the other startups where I've seen that seen that a lot of young people well don't really have this connection between. Uh, work needs to be done on time and well to get paid, uh, which is uh, which was a clear insight for me to start uh, writing this stuff and and shipping shipping this book ultimately. Rick, there's no shortage of time management books in the in the the genre, right? Franklin Covey, of course, probably has sold as many, if not more, than most of the authors combined. You mentioned some of the great ones, you know, Getting Things Done by David Allen. Of course, our series of books, starting with First Things First, at its at its at its launch, the most well read purchased time management book in history. And then of course we went on to publish What Matters Most and most recently The Five Choices. Do you think that with the focus, the spotlight on productivity and time management, do you think we've gotten better at it or worse or has technology been more helpful or perhaps more harmful? Oh, those are some, some broad questions, but I think in, 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 in all of the different um, uh, the ways, ways that we can tackle our work, um, there is a message and an approach that uh, there is no universal message or approach. And what I found is that there is a specific group of uh, mostly young people, but I've also seen older people uh, that uh, really want something that's that's super hands on. That's not not wishy washy or not not focused on what do I want to accomplish in life at first, but really like okay, I I have a huge um, a mailbox full of stuff. I need to get that done 
I have responsibilities as a as an employee towards my team that I need to get done. Um, I just want to survive, and that's I think where my message really uh, really really resonates. On the broader level, what you're mentioning, did we get better at it? Uh, well, if you if you're looking at the scale of things that we need to accomplish today, the number of um, the number of things that had our way in terms of communication, in terms of messaging, but also the fact that you and I are talking uh, across the globe uh, and connect, connecting, that, that's not something that was possible um, 30, 40 years ago. And with that, our, the complexity of our work also dramatically increased. So I think, yes, uh, well, there are some improvements, uh, but one, the world got way more complicated. So that's, uh, that's also what, what re requires us to rethink how we work. Uh, and on top of that, uh, well, if you look at the statistics, um, we have not been dramatically improving our productivity. So we're, we're a bit plateaued in that sense, uh, what, we can, what we can produce, basically. Rick, I want to expand on something you mentioned there, kind of about an individualized productivity approach. I think I, I spend most of my time in the leadership career space with my role at Franklin Covey, my role as an entrepreneur, as an author, podcaster, and speaker. And I think we're seeing something post-pandemic, which is a new style of leadership, what we'll call sort of individualized leadership, recognizing that someone's leadership style has to work for every member of their team. And those members communicate differently, they listen differently, their fears, their passions, their joys, their mission, their talents are all different. And now, post-pandemic, if you want to recruit and retain the top talent, you've got to make sure that your leadership style is not broad-brushed and meeting everyone the same. It's an individualized leadership style. It requires a different level of engagement and leadership, quite frankly. I'm guessing the same is true with our, our planning tools, our productivity systems, that increasingly you're evangelizing an individual approach. Don't just use this or just use that or use this this way. Talk about how important it is to embrace and recognize what works for you may not work for somebody else as it relates to your um, working smart and getting stuff done. Yeah, yeah. So I think key here is that we mostly assume that the way we work is, is a given, is something that's, well, the, in your first job, you, you'll figure out a little bit on how, how productive you can be, and then that's how, who you are, and then you take that alongside with you, of course, of the 40, 50, 60 years maybe that you're working. Um, and that was my starting point of thinking, of how, how, do, how do we think about that? And, and, and how should we individually approach the way we work? We spend so much time on thinking on what we should work on, uh, or maybe maybe how to solve particular problems in our work on our expertise, but we don't spend a lot of time thinking about uh, our way of working. And I specifically want to target people that are not the the kind of kind of uh, time management nerds uh, like I am uh, that want to experiment with this stuff, but I really want to give something um, that's uh, that's quite universal. And that starts with how you manage uh, how, you, how you manage your week and how you manage your time, and that it starts with uh, with a calendar. And I do think while what you say what you say is correct, I think um, uh, through experimenting we can arrive at something that's unique for all of us. But there are some principles in basic time management that apply to uh, apply to all of us, like our, the fact that our time is is basically is finite, it's like that, that there is no unlimited amount of hours in the day, in the week, and in the year. And as soon as people realize that, they will start to approach their, their work from a different angle. And let me also reiterate that this is, like, I think none of, none of what's in the book is new or groundbreaking, particularly groundbreaking, but it's like bringing those proven concepts together in a really uh, a, approachable um, form that you can just hand hand to your as as leaders because most of the people that will be watching it and and are listening to this will be leaders mostly experienced leaders but what do you give to someone that just uh, starts out in your team how do you help them be successful uh, on their personal so on their personal um, stuff that they have to tackle as an individual uh, and that's really the the question that I try to try to answer in this book Rick pivot to what is I think my big my biggest uh, insight is this concept of stop storing stuff in your head. Now, it seems mm. simple, right? But the fact of the matter is a lot of us don't have the discipline or the focus to 
have a note capture system. Talk about how dangerous it is for us and the implications of, quote, storing stuff in our head and how liberating it is to have a system to deal with that. So our brains are wired to focus on something that's, well, that's triggering us, but also the stuff that's, that comes easy. So um, what you will see is that if there is a hard thing that you need to tackle, anything that's distracting, anything that's easier for your brain to focus on, uh, your brain will focus on, right? So uh, if I have to write a particularly hard chapter or if I, if I have to write to a report or have to think deeply about something, there will be, will be signals that um, my brain will receive that are easier to get. Like I have to respond to a certain text message still or I have to get, get something from the store after I, uh, after I got home. So I'm already thinking about those kind of, those kind of things, right? And um, if I don't have a way to, um, to basically uh, postpone these, these signals for later, uh, I have a way harder time to focus on the hard stuff. So in order to be, uh, to be proficient at what we do, in order to be really creative. Uh, and again, this is not a new idea. This is like something that David Allen has been uh, advocating for his entire life, but, uh, but like this is something that I want to uh, bring to an as broad audience as possible. Like you need something to store any thought in. And I basically underscored it by saying, by saying from now on, never ever store anything in your head ever again. Like this is, your, your brain should not be a hard drive. It should be working memory, something that allows you to do your best work leverage systems for the other stuff because it's not worth your time uh, having the same uh, same thought twice right so you you will you want to uh, put that somewhere where you can um, retrieve it at at a, at a certain time um, that fits you and one of the things that i've been really fascinated by but uh, some people um, find it scary is like the it's of course a new invention from from elon musk where uh, this is called the Neuralink, where you get some kind of an implant in your brain which dramatically increases the, uh, the amount of bandwidth for your brain. And uh, that's something that we, we, we desperately, desperately need. Um, but I can imagine that it feels a bit scary to, <laughs> to have some, some, something like that implanted uh, in your brain. And I, I feel uh, that um, uh, that's something that's not happening in this next year. There's also, of course, there's also a, a, less, a, a less intrusive approach and that's called a simple to-do list. And <laughs> it, this can be anywhere. So pick something that, that fits you, but you should have at least uh, some place and preferably it should be one. And that's where a lot of us go off the rails as well. You have a to-do list here, you have a book of notes there, you have something on your computer. And then of course, uh, it's not weird that you feel stressed out because your brain thinks, okay, where is, where is my note? It can be there, it can be there. Okay, then, and, and then with that, the stress, um, it keeps creeping in. Uh, so if you, if you want to improve on that, make sure you have one system and make it, make it simpler. Return to one place. And with that, you will feel, if you drop in anything that pops into your mind, you will feel that uh, the stress uh, goes away uh, because you have one system you can depend on. So my choices there were either a neural implant or to-do list. I pick yes. the latter. And I think, you know, I think it's a profound reminder to us all. It's a transformational insight for me to be reminded that there is stuff that's reoccurring in my head all the time, right? Whether it be, I, I can think of one thing in particular that's been dogging me for the better part of a week. I did not write it down. It did not add to my checklist. My wife has been kind of hounding me about, did you resolve this? Is this finished? Are we in the clear on this? And finally this morning I made the call, the person called me back, I got it checked off, and I won't think about it again. But it has been no doubt taking up probably an hour of my mind over the last week or so, mm. collectively thinking about who is the person, where is their phone number, do I have their email address, do I have the data? I think it's a great liberator for us to recognize that we all are storing too much stuff in our brains and need to open that space up for creativity, right? And for uh, the, the genius that we have to offer. Um, yeah, so add, and, and if I may add one thing to that is that if you have a thought and you feel you feel that you're running in circles, right? You're, 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 you're trying to tackling anything that's complicated. The, your brain will hang on to the first step in order to get to the second step. And if you get to the second step, your brain also needs to go back to the first and then to the second and then to figure out the third one. And that gets complicated really quickly. 
So it's really hard to entangle any mess if it's not outside of your brain. So it's, it also really helps into figuring out, okay, what's something that's bugging me? I will write it down into my to-do list. This is all super simple stuff, but we indeed, what you're saying, we need this reminder. I also need this reminder to, to keep doing this. And then if you see this in front of you, you will think, oh, okay, but that, okay, I, I can resolve this. I can handle this because I need to do X, Y, and Z, maybe three steps, right? So, and, and, and by the simple act of just writing it down, you feel, okay, I need, no, I need to, to, to get a phone number for this guy because I don't know how to get to him, but that has been bugging me for so long and I can actually do this, uh, if that makes sense. Rick, I'd love to know where you stand on the concept known as you know, kind of the hustle culture. It's a very much of an American uh, concept right now. And I would tell you, we've interviewed everybody there is to interview in this space. On one side, there's an American author, entrepreneur, real estate investor called Grant Cardone. He's written a, a lot of uh, very famous books here. And one of his philosophies is work harder, work more. You need to work more. That the commonality among successful people is they just work harder, they outwork everybody. So he argues working more, faster, harder, but generally working more. And of course the opposite end is perhaps Arianna Huffington, the very famous media expert and the author of Thrive and the founder of Huffington Post and others like that. And she would talk about the real, very real personal aspect of burnout and the health impacts and the destruction on relationships and your ability to you know, be around. I don't want you to pick the middle because that's a safe place. But when it comes to the hustle culture, because I find myself bouncing. Okay, Grant Cardone, I got to work harder. Ariana says, I'm going to have a stroke. I got to slow down. What riff on that? Yeah. So my take on this is that um, sometimes you are on one end and sometimes you are on the other. And the key problem is that most of us do, do not have any system to think about where you are on that spectrum at any given moment. Because just like the seasons, this changes, right? So, and, and just like in, this changes in a week, this changes in a month, this changes in a year, and also in a decade. So I have two very young kids, so one and three, uh, and, I, and I, have, I have rough nights. So I know that I need to be really careful about the hours that I spend on work right now. I don't have too much other, other hours to give right now, uh, and that's fine. So I know that it needs to get done between nine and six during the day, preferably, because I don't know what happens in the evenings and nights. And um, one thing that I need for this is some kind of a system and a structure to help me keep that in check, to help me figure out, am I going too fast or am I going too slow? And for that, um, what I see people doing a lot is they doubt a lot during the week, but also during the month and the quarter and the year, um, if they are on the right trajectory. And that, that, that's the case, because if there is no moment set in time where you will reevaluate how your week is going, how your quarter is going, how your year is going, you don't know where you are. So my take on that is if you do not have a system, which uh, something that forces you to check in with yourself, and not, on, not just on a yearly basis, because that's way too long, um, but that forces you to check in with yourself and to answer some questions like, hey, how, how do I think things are going? Um, am I on the right path or on the right trajectory? And am, can I change some stuff? If, you, if, you're, if the answer is to this is like, this happens only by accident or only whenever someone that I meet triggers something in me, then the chances are that you leave stuff on the table. Um, so that would be my, my answer to, to this question. Rick, I'm going to give you some advice. Like you, my wife Stephanie and I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old, so I empathize with you. But then, Rick, our three-year-old became a five-year-old, and our one-year-old became a three-year-old, and then we had a newborn baby. So we had, like, a newborn, a three-year-old, yeah. and a five-year-old. Rick, yeah. don't do that, <laughs> whatever you do. <laughs> Back to the office. Uh, I want to talk about a different topic that I found fascinating in your book. You call it... Um, the year plan day, making yes. plans for the year in just one day. Talk about that concept. Yeah. So the idea is, of course, that a lot of us may have, have New Year's resolution, right? So you think about, okay, these are some, there are three or four things that I want to do in the next year. And of course, when February or March happens, we've already long forgotten what those items were. And while I think those resolutions are really good, they, again, don't have any, any form of, um, of system that they hook into. 
And with the year plan day, I basically give a, a really simple structure that does three things. One, the first step is you take time to reflect and look back on, on what happened. And uh, one of the things I can go on for a day uh, about, about how to do this, but one of the things that I, I, lo I love to do is I go over my calendar for the last year, I look at each week, and then I make a list of the stuff that I really liked and, and a list of the stuff that I disliked. And you will see how much of the, the things that happen you already long, long forgotten, which is, which, is, which is fascinating. And I also go over all my photos, for example, uh, once a year. Um, and just seeing that will already change my behavior for the next year. Because if I see that anytime I, uh, I meet with friends with kids over the weekend, for example, and I enjoy those moments and then looking back, I see, okay, those were the, were the great weekends. I will change my behavior in the future. So that's the first part. And the second part is what I call the brainstorm phase. And that's what we all also often not, not really do. It's give yourself the permission to once a year um, uh, do the most complicated, the most comprehensive brainstorm on how you want your life to look like. Um, so not really bound to a year. But spend, spend a couple of hours on sketching out, hey, if I'm thinking about my family, if I think about my friends, if I think about my work, if I think about how, uh, I'll kind of, what kind of hobbies I have outside of work, how do I want my life to look and what kind of things are on that list? Um, and that's the second, the second phase. And you will, you will find that over time that there will be some consistent parts, but also some parts that change. And then in the third part, you will set um, really concrete goals for the next three, three months. And that's basically the kickoff to have, to have a fantastic year. I've been doing this since 2014. Um, and I can honestly say that, that all my biggest uh, projects, um, the, my biggest uh, work life changes, uh, and also the family changes um, originated mostly in doing this brainstorm and triggering myself to think in a different direction for, for where I wanna be and how I wanna go. I think it's a superb idea. You're the only second person that I've ever heard talk about this. I'm sure it's not unique to you. My speech coach, her name is Judy Henricks, and she lives in St. Louis, Missouri. And once a year, she goes out a couple of hours to a cabin that she and her husband own alone for a weekend, and she reflects on her year. She does the same thing you did. She looks back at all of her photographs and her journals and her appointments and decides what worked, what didn't, and what does she want to do differently or the same for the coming year. I've always been sort of jealous of her ability to have the discipline and the cabin <laughs> and the time and the bandwidth to go do that, but you've reminded yeah. me of a great, a great um, opportunity we all have. Maybe it's not a full day, right? Maybe it's a, a long breakfast by ourselves or something like that where we reflect. It doesn't have to be on December 31st, right? It could be on oh. May 1st. Any, at any point during the year, you don't have to wait another year to have that sort of self-reflection planning meeting. Uh, Rick, let's... Um, Let's talk about productivity tools. You are a software engineer, you are an agency owner, an entrepreneur, a leader of teams, you're an author on the topic. Are there any tools that you have found are perhaps being dated and aren't as relevant? And what do you see on the horizon that you might want to evangelize that uh, all the listeners and viewers might be thinking about in terms of their to-do lists, their task lists, their calendars, any paper planning tools that you're passionate about you want to talk to? Yeah, so, so I think the, the, the first biggest thing that I can mention here is that if you are the person that likes to try out something new every once in a while for productivity, I'm, I, this, this, won't, this won't be a nice thing to hear because uh, what I've found is that mostly for those people, the switch will not make you more productive, but only makes you, uh, make, makes you maybe a little bit happier with what you're using mm -hmm. in the short term, which can be a fine, uh, a very fine uh, benefit from switching every once in a while. Um, uh, but that's what I've found. So, and, and in general, I think if you struggle with this, if you struggle to keep up, if you struggle to, um, well, to keep your head above the water, so to say, then I would, my suggestion would be keep it super simple. So have one calendar app, um, maybe the calendar app that's already on your phone, which is the simplest possible one you can get as long as the overview is correct. Um, have one to-do list, um, the default one, uh, that Apple ships is, is, is great. And also the default one that Google ships with Google Tasks is great. It works really well. Uh, also the default one in Outlook is fine. Like most people wor uh, work with Outlook in their work. So they, it already contains a really good task manager. 
And as long as you've not explored at least one keyboard shortcut for, uh, for any one of them, you have not found the, the limit in what it can do, right? So that will be the, the number one suggestion to start there. Explore what you have and then try to make sure that those that, that setup is simple. That said, there are, of course, as a geek, a couple of things that are coming our way. And I think one is that, um, that we need tools to help us stay focused. And what do you need for focus? It's a, 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 an, an, a block of time that's preferably at least one and a half to two hours, maybe three hours in length um, that, is, that, that we can actually use for ourselves. That's what you mentioned, like this breakfast that we can, um, uh, that we can reclaim, that we can fully spend on our own priorities. And there are a bunch of tools on that. So Reclaim is a reclaim.ai is a good one. That's an integration for your calendar. There's also Clockwise, which is a plugin in your calendar. And I also want to plug uh, Rise Calendar, which is the startup that I'm currently working on. And this is really in the calendar space. So um, think about how to manage your personal time, but also time as a, as a team. So that's one. And then on task managers, I love what Things is doing. Things is a calendar, or sorry, a, a to-do list um, app for Mac. If you are a heavy a Mac user and also an iPhone user. On the Android front, I love what Todoist is doing. Todoist is basically a to-do list manager that's separate from the apps that you're mostly already using. Uh, but they are doing uh, a couple of great things to help you stay organized across different platforms. So whether you use Windows or a Mac or an Android phone or whatever kind of device you're using, they are there with Todoist. Uh, so that's a great that's a great um, uh, a great second uh, second uh, choice for for to-do list manager. Rick, thank you for the menu. Let's uh, end the conversation with you being vulnerable and talking about what are some of the things, maybe one thing that you stopped doing, a decision, a pattern, a habit, a negative recurring thought. What have you stopped doing as a result of your research as a leader, entrepreneur, writing this book that has brought some level of congruence or harmony or increased productivity in your life that others can learn from? Yeah, so, so I think it's a great question. And um, one of the things I had to think about immediately is um, the idea that, I, um, that if, I, if, if, if I did not invent, invent it, that it's not uh, good enough. So especially when I was starting off, um, I found that I had to use the tools and I had to use my, my thinking time to come up with, with a lot of original stuff. And if it's not original, if, if, like, if, if it had not been tried before, uh, or if it had tried before, it was not good enough. So as soon as I let go of that, um, part of the, a lot of the stuff that's, that's, in, that's in the book is even uh, not super original, but phrased in a way that resonates with, with myself. But also in how I do and my work, how I do my business, I found that I need to look and be, be way more open to the other stuff that's already been done and then study that. Uh, and then if I look, if I have knowledge of what the three, four, five things that have been done before, um, I can have um, way better thoughts on how I should do things. So what I really let go of is try to reinvent everything again um, and be like, put aside my, my ego a little bit more. Uh, and then focus on building on top of what the other giants already have tried and built and then see where I can, move, uh, can improve that um, a little bit every, every single day. Rick, you and I have a very similar writing style. I think we're both aggregators and we're pollinators and those uh, ideas and tools and processes that we learn from others, those authors are delighted to have us shine the spotlight on them as you have done in GRIP, The Art of Working Smart and Getting to What Matters Most. Rick Pastor, the author of the Dutch book that became an overnight sensation in Holland and now available across the world. Rick, thanks for joining us on On Leadership. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, Scott. And stop storing things in your head. Get them down, get them out, so you can use that precious neural power to unleash your genius in your creativity. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership.